Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Wrong Men. And did I say wrong men? <laughs> the raw men. I think we're on episode 90 at this point, and, and uh, very pleased today to be speaking with, uh, with Matt Bulger and Ron Millar. And we and this is for the, oh, what is it, the, the Free Thought Alliance? Get, fill me in. What is, the, what is the name of this organization? I forget. We both work for the Center for Free Thought Equality. Center for, that's what I was missing. <laughs> Thank you, Center for Free Thought Equality. All right, and I was, I was very excited to, to, uh, to meet you guys at the American Humanist National Convention in Las Vegas, where you were talking about a couple of things that, that uh, had me pretty excited. I mean, we, we live, I think, in uh, pretty dark times politically. Uh, and so it was, it was good to hear some kind of good you know, coming out, uh, coming out of, of your organization. So there were two things that I was interested in. I want to—I will give you a chance to both introduce yourselves appropriately. But I, I, I wanted to talk about uh, two things, and and th that being the the Free Thought Caucus, I think it was, and the the Darwin Day Initiative. So can you tell me whatever you can about the organization and about either of these initiatives? Sure, sure. Um, yeah, the organization we work for is the Center for Free Thought Equality. It's the advocacy and political arm of the American, Com American Humanist Association. The Humanist Association is a C3 nonprofit. As an advocacy group, the Center for Free Thought Equality is a C4 um, uh, organization. Uh, so the only difference between the two is, as a C4, you can do unlimited advocacy. The sad news is any donations to that organization are not tax deductible, unlike to a C3. Now, connected to the Center for Free Thought Equality is a political action committee, um, the Free Thought Equality Fund. And it's a regular PAC. Um, it endorses candidates. Um, we're a federal PAC, so we can give money to congressional candidates. We're also registered in California, so we can make direct donations there to candidates. And then for the other candidates we endorse at state and local levels, we ask them, uh, we ask our membership, because it is a membership PAC, we ask our members to support those candidates. Yeah. And I'm Matthew Bolger, and I'm the legislative director here at the Center for Free Thought Equality, um, which, as Ron mentioned, is a sister uh, organization of the American Humanist Association. Uh, and I spend most of my time uh, speaking with people on Capitol Hill uh, and within the administration on a wide variety of issues um, from the humanist perspective. Obviously, a large part of the work that we do is focused on the separation of church and state and science advocacy. Uh, but that, as a progressive organization, uh, we do work on a wide array of issues outside of those two issues. Okay, so um, yeah, on either of these initiatives, uh, who was responsible for which one? <laughs> sure. Um, <laughs> the Congressional Free Thought Caucus. Um, we have to step back a little bit. Um, uh, in, in, in the summer and fall of 2017, I started sending out candidate questionnaires to uh, folks running for Congress and also people who are already in Congress. And we were very fortunate to get a questionnaire back from Jared Huffman, who represents California's second congressional district. And you know, so our questionnaire is, is a list of policy questions. It also asks about you know, religious background. Um, and so he had some interesting comments in the religion area. So it set up a back and forth between us about, um, you know, where he, where he was with regard to his religious identity. And that eventually led to a dinner, um, which Roy Speckhart, who's the executive director of the American Humanist Association also attended. And so we went through with him the pros and cons of how he could identify um, with the secular community. Um, he did a very wise thing. He talked to his family, friends, political colleagues about the idea of identifying as an agnostic and humanist. And he got very good feedback from those folks. The political folks were a little concerned about him um, announcing that he was agnostic, but he decided to move forward anyway. And so that was in November of last year that he made that announcement. And he got tremendous feedback um, from his constituents um, individually and through social media. Um, there was very little to no negative um, uh, feedback from his constituents. So that really pumped him up. And it also pumped up members of Congress, too, because they were looking at him and saying, you know, you did this and it was okay politically. Um, everyone assumes, you know, that this is the last taboo in American politics, uh, uh, announcing you're with the secular community. So 
he had several conversations with his colleagues about what he did help. And in our discussions at that dinner way back last year, we listed out several, like, here's our hopes of what would happen. And one of the things we talked to him about was setting up a, a caucus within Congress for uh, people identify as atheist humanists and also allies who want to help out in church state separation and protecting the secular character of our government. And we said, well, obviously, you know, you can't be a caucus of one. Um, but with all these conversations he had, he called us in, I think, January of this year saying, hey, I've got interest in forming that caucus we talked about. And so we held several meetings. Um, the first meeting, five members of Congress attended. And um, Jamie Raskin, who is a co-founder of the caucus, was just so enthused. He said, you know, this is historic. Um, and, you know, we, it's hard to overstate what a jump this could be for our community. Um, if we can get more members of Congress to identify with us, to be allies with us, promote our public policy on Capitol Hill, it's just going to move uh, us forward in ways that, that we thought wouldn't happen for years and years. So, and, and as many of us didn't think was ever going to happen at all. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, so, you know, we're up to nine members now. It's a, it was officially formed in April. They've had several meetings now. Um, and so they're putting together sort of their policy agenda also how they're going to reach out to more members of Congress. And um, yeah, it's very exciting, very unexpected to happen this soon. And um, yeah, I, when I got his, his message, I was just like, I can't, I'm old and a little jaded, but that message made me so happy and like so hopeful. And I, and I and I'm still, still riding on that wave. that This is going to be a major change for our community. It is, and I'm trying to imagine. I'm trying to imagine our current American Congress having a a, a, a free thought group. In, in, that's that, that's uh, that's our current. American, you know that that that's hard for me to that's hard for me to understand. I, I would love to. See, are, are these meetings are they available on any kind of a public media? Is there any way that other people can participate? Is there anything else we should know about that? Apparently, they're not public. I mean, because part of it, you want it to be a safe space for people to talk about their religious beliefs. At the last meeting, we actually had a Republican come in hmm. and, and sit with the meeting. And um, we had Daniel Dennett speaking uh, to the group. And it was just, again, it's building relationships, making people see that, you know, there is no difference between us and and just getting getting rid of those misconceptions about you know, what our members of who yeah. secularists and humanists are. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very impressed that you brought uh, Dennett. I mean, I, I've met Dennett a couple of times, and it's not just that he's a good speaker and all like that. He's, he's just a genuinely good guy. He's, I mean, he's certainly a, a good way to, to win people into a perspective. You know, to, to, he's, he's a very presentable representative is probably the best way I can put that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, Matthew. What can you tell us? I mean, I'm guessing you, the, the Darwin Day initiative was your idea, right? Uh, it was actually not my idea, uh, but it's something I've been working on for a while. Um, we were really happy yet again to get another House resolution introduced this year, uh, recognizing Darwin Day. Um, but we were also enormously proud for the first time to get a Senate companion resolution introduced as well. Um, and, you know, the Darwin Day resolution does a lot of important things. Uh, it affirms the validity of the theory of evolution. It uh, opposes the teaching of creationism in public science classrooms. Uh, and it also tries to get members to support sound science on a variety of issues. Uh, I think the most prominent one would have to be uh, on climate change, where we still have um, a lot of people who are uh, pretty unwilling to accept the sound science that exists on this issue. Uh, is it an entirely a commercial reason why they're doing this? I mean, I would guess that they're just beholden to the fossil fuel industry. That would be the whole reason I would think. There is definitely some connection uh, to industry, which fuels a reluctance to take action on this issue. I also think that there are people with sincerely held religious beliefs who genuinely think uh, that, you know, the world was created by God and that the world can only be destroyed by God and that human interaction and involvement uh, is relatively negligible. 
Uh, obviously, the science doesn't bear this out. Uh, and while I certainly respect the right of those people to hold those beliefs as private individuals, I think the situation is a little bit different, different uh, when you're a representative of the people uh, and you're in responsible for making sure that they're not susceptible to environmental disasters uh, and all the things that can occur if we don't take action soon on climate change. And it's hopefully one of the things uh, that the caucus will be able to support as well. Um, we're, we're currently working with them on a wide array of legislation. Uh, we're currently pushing a bill which seeks to oppose blasphemy laws. Uh, and I think that this is something that will really fit into uh, the mission of the caucus. Uh, now, remember, it's not just a caucus to promote the separation of church and state or to foster dialogue on religious belief. Uh, an explicit stated goal of the caucus is also to promote public policy that's based on reason and science. And I think that this is a pretty good example of, of what uh, the caucus and humanists care about and that we'll be working on in the future. You understand that there are there are states, there are like three states that have somehow managed to find loopholes in the law where and they, they can teach creationism in public schools. I mean, Louisiana and Tennessee are two, and I think Kentucky might be the third, I can't remember. Sure. It's, it, it's disturbing to me that you can teach something as fact when there's not an ounce of truth to it. And in the course of doing that, deliberately deceive and mislead students lying to them sure. about what the established science is because that's what creationism requires you can't teach creationism honestly you can't defend creationism honestly it requires lying to people to do that how is this justified under the law so we've seen several different state bills uh, and even some federal legislation which doesn't have the force of law because state educational programming or state governments control educational programming by and large um, but encourage states to teach the controversy. Um, that's really what we're seeing. Not so much an attempt to remove evolution from public school science rooms. I think they realize that's a losing battle, uh, but there is a big emphasis uh, in a lot of Southern states. I'm originally from Texas, so I hear about it from my friends a lot as well, uh, who seek to, as they say, inject as much information as possible into the science classroom about this issue. They, they claim that they want to have a comprehensive review uh, of evolutionary biology and so that the best way to do this is to have a wide ranging conversation about the various theories. Uh, I, I think obviously it's a mistake to equate legitimate scientific research uh, with um, the religious belief that really seems to inform creationism. or in False equivalence uh, fallacy where you present your baseless speculation as if it were equivalent to theory exactly and, you know, have the right to an opinion but no, not everyone or no one has the right to their own facts um the idea that uh people look at the theory of evolution as just something that's unfounded unproven um really just does not match with reality and i think that you know if you have private religious schools which are not funded by public taxpayer dollars and that's something that they want to do that's their right to do so I would argue they're doing a disservice to their child um, by kind of putting them back a few years in science education, which can really impact both their understanding of the world around them and can also impact their ability to get uh, jobs in certain fields, which rely upon a scientific understanding of the world. Um, but I think I think that line is really crossed whenever there are attempts to uh, stop the teaching of evolution in public schools. That's a completely separate issue from what goes on in private religious schools. And it's something that we're going to continue to oppose and uh, ask members of Congress to join with us in opposing. It's got to be a strange challenge because these people, the, the, the defenders of creationism, the defenders of the faith, if you will, they, they want so badly to misrepresent the teaching of established scientific fact, the demonstrable realities. You know, the truth is what the facts are. They want to, they, they want to oppose this as if, as if teaching what we understand about science is somehow a religion. Again, the false equivalence fallacy. Yeah, I mean, I think you see that a lot. And I think right now, uh, both in our capital and around America, people are kind of grappling with what is reality, what is fact, uh, what is opinion, um, which is why I think that getting people uh, to kind of understand what science actually is and what it is not, and to kind of not listen to the propaganda um, from people like Ken Ham uh, and his affiliates, I think is really important. And I think it's a, a duty uh, that we as humanists all have is to have respectful conversations 
uh, with people around us who are willing to engage with us about what we believe, what we don't believe, uh, and also to try and give them additional information that they might not have access to in their own religious communities surrounding issues of largely settled science uh, like evolution. I want to brag for a moment. I, I got an opportunity that I think is absolutely unique. I was I, a month from now, I'll be in Chandler, Arizona for what was initially supposed to be something along the lines of a debate or that kind of environment, at least some kind of discussion of the opposing viewpoints. But then I was invited to do something else beyond that. I was asked to teach a one hour class to a creationist megachurch. At least I've, I've, been, I've heard reports that this is a megachurch where they wanted me to, to teach the basics of evolution and the facts that are cited to support the theory. Now that this is a unique opportunity to address a lot of the, 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 the misgivings, you know, what a theory is, for example, and, and, and a lot of the misinformation that they have. So I'm very excited that I'm going to be able to do that a, a month from now. I'm also very excited that uh, I'm hoping to have a closer association with you with your organization because I'm very charged up about the work that you guys are doing. Uh, Ron Millar, for example, uh, I was at the the Texas Democratic Convention and there was a free thought. Uh, there was, excuse me, there was a secular caucus, and I was amazed to be in that room. I have to tell everybody I didn't get the the, the whole thing, and and we were talking about this just before I started recording. But I wanted to, the, the audience to know that when I first walked into this room for this caucus, there were like eight people there and that's all I was expecting. And that's all I would, would normally expect from Texas. And in previous election years, maybe that's all I could expect. But this year was a whole different thing because within 10 minutes, the room filled to where there were hundreds of people. I want to say that maybe 300 people fit into that room and they were in standing room only. And they were at, there were a number of advocates. I didn't get all the speakers because I, I had to move the camera because the crowd there was no way to film from my original location. So I missed the first uh, couple of speakers or the first few speakers. And three of them, I wanted to say, thanked Ron Millar by name for, uh, for endorsing them. Uh, so I just wanted you to be aware of that. Uh, and some of them were, were saying that they weren't just there to advocate for secular politics. And there were Christians there who said that even though they were Christian, they understood the value of the separation of church and state. And that's important that they do that. But there were also people there who were saying that uh, they they wanted to advocate for, for atheism. Now, they, these were candidates running for office who, who not only said that they needed to protect secular values, but they also needed to advocate for the rights of atheists who were be, who were a demographic who were uh, being you know having having a prejudice of, of various types as a minority as well. And so I was I was very pleased to hear that. So I just wanted you to know, since you weren't in the room yourself, and I, I, I failed in getting that out of the public, uh, I wanted you to know that that happened. Now, that's very exciting because, I mean, the only way we can make change happen is by building institutions. So the Secular Coalition is doing a great job going state by state to try to build secular caucuses. And, you know, I worked with Sarah Levin in identifying the candidates that we, we endorsed, the, the Free Thought Equality PAC endorsed to have them be speakers in Texas. And, you know, we're identifying leaders across the country. We've endorsed over 100 candidates so far at state, local, and federal races. And these people are all potential leaders within our movement. So I just really want to encourage people to, to reach out to these folks, even after the elections, because these could be the future leaders within our movement. And, and you know, we're identifying people. So we have to bring them into our movement um, get them involved. Um, and again, the, the Congressional Free Thought Caucus is another institution building uh, with the ultimate goal of getting the Democratic Party to recognize atheists and humanists as a constituent of the party and an important constituent of the party. And so we're only going to be able to do that if we have state groups that are active, uh, the, the congressional group being active, and people getting involved in, in, in the political arena. Um, at our website at the Free Thought Equality Fund, um, we have several resources about how, as an individual, you can get involved, as getting your C3 group involved legally, what the limitations are, and also how to run for office, um, you know, just some basic guidelines. So my big pitch here today is become a member of the Center for Free Thought Equality. It's absolutely free, and that's the only way you can learn more about our candidates because I'll be sending off emails um, 
and then you'll get to know about our advocacy work too. Um, so again, become politically involved. This is the year to do it. I mean, mm -hmm. this is such an exciting election year. And On that point, I have to ask you a question. How would you address, I mean, this was the biggest problem that I had in the 2016 election and in the prior election. Uh, we had here in the here in the midterms, uh, we were electing a governor back in 2014, and and I was there uh, when Wendy Davis was running against Greg Abbott, and we had a record low turnout for voters. And of course, the Republican Party always gets favored; they always win when there's a low voter turnout every time. So that the biggest issue that I have is the Democrats and the independents. Anybody who, 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 anybody who does not identify as a Republican who comes up with that lame excuse that they don't want to vote because both parties are the same or it's a broken system or whatever other lame excuse it is that causes them to always lose. How do you address the people who don't vote and who, don't, who, who say that their vote doesn't count or that, or that we shouldn't vote? Right. Well, fortunately, some of that work is being done for us. I mean, Donald Trump is just such a horrendous candidate. The fact that, that, that this Supreme Court justice pick could overturn abortion rights in the country. I mean, it's hard for me, because I'm a political animal, to see why people aren't active or more active. But we're seeing people hitting the streets. We're seeing you know, with the kids being caged up with immigration. It's becoming personal. Um, and it's just, you have to have the conversation with your neighbors, colleagues, co-workers, friends and relatives, just to explain the public policy, how this affects them directly and how it reflects how our country <laughs> and our policies reflect on them and as us on a society. And we can do better. We can do much better. And we're only going to do better once more atheists and humanists are involved in the process. Um, you know, if a quarter of our population, when you include the nuns, are effectively out of the system uh, because they feel they can't participate authentically. Uh, you know, no wonder things are so bad. We just we have to be aggressive, um, and we have to be aggressive with our friends and neighbors, saying that they they need to participate and, and showing how it affects their bottom line. And, and if you them. don't mind me, if you don't mind me adding this this bit, I mean, there there's a lot of of purists. Uh, out there who, who will say that they, you know, they're not going to vote for anybody that until it becomes a perfect situation. Well, obviously, the Republicans realize that their candidate is way not perfect, right? But he is a tool that they can use, and they know that they can manipulate him. And I've seen, like with, with Hillary, for example, she actually backed down on a couple of her positions where, where you know, she knew that their constituents wanted one thing and she might, wanted, might have wanted another. Uh, I would say something to her credit uh, we, uh, one point where she said that she has a public persona and a personal persona and that she would she would actually vote against her own interests in favor of the constituency. When do you see that happening in the Republican Party? Instead, you have you have Trump saying that he's immune to, you know, NRA and all of these. Things, but then he turns around and cow and bows to them within two days. So this, this seems to be if, if you're looking for the perfect candidate, there isn't one. But is there one you can work with? Because the biggest issue that I think we have is just the people who come up with these lame excuses not to vote. And, and that's what I'm hoping you guys can address in just a moment. And, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd just add one more thing on to what you were saying previously uh, about getting people to participate. Uh, and even about the kind of surprise that the Congressional Free Thought Caucus was even formed in the first place. I think those are natural consequences of when religion and explicitly Christian uh, favoritism is injected into our politics. I think some people will see the attempt uh, by the religious right to uh, make being an American the same thing as being an evangelical Christian as something that alienates them. They refuse to participate in the political process under such circumstances. But I think for a certain uh, number of Americans, it only motivates them to participate more. Um, I think we would not be seeing this Congressional Free Thought Caucus not only be founded, but start gaining members as rapidly as it has uh, if the president had made such hadn't made such an I issue out of uh, being religious in this country, I don't think that we'd have some of the pushback that we've seen legislatively uh, if the president hadn't been so extreme in some of his policies. So it's it's definitely something um, that's disconcerting. You're always unhappy to see bad policy uh, turn into law. Uh, one of the positive upsides of it, though, is that it's engendering participation from segments of society 
which might not have been uh, very politically active in the past. Uh, what I've just been trying to tell friends and family is once this election is done, you can't stop. Um, this is something where your lack of participation could cause this situation to happen yet again. Um, so I think I think it's kind of dispelled the myth that political parties are identical. Um, that might have been true in the third way era of the 90s. Uh, I don't think it's true anymore on a wide array of policy issues. Uh, obviously on church state separation, there's a significant difference. Uh, I, I, we haven't seen this on the federal level, but we have seen in many, uh, if, if, you, if you look up the, the, the Republican Party platform for your state, you will very likely see a more overt endorsement of religion. It's the true in, it's true in Texas, and I, I saw one a, a day or two ago, I think it was for Ohio, where they, they express an awful lot of God-related religious messages. And you, you know, I know three atheists who identify as Republicans, but I don't understand how you could if the platform requires a religious adherence, as a couple of them out there for the, at the state level do. I mean, uh, yeah, it's it's a tough situation, and I think our hope is not to affiliate with one party over the other. I think our true hope is to promote religious freedom and at the same time have parties who recognize the importance of the separation between church and state, both for, for the protections that it affords uh, government, but also for the ones that it affords to religious society as a whole. Um, we've found ourselves to be pretty fortunate to be able to work with a large number of very conservative Republicans on a resolution that we're working on right now, which opposes blasphemy laws. And so I think what Ron's talking about before, about building institutions, building trust, will hopefully lead to us being able to have some honest conversations with Republican allies uh, who have a bit of a different perspective on secularism than perhaps the current conservative mainstream. Uh, I certainly don't look uh, at any political uh, ideology held mainstream Republicans, I guess we'll say, as something that is uh, unable to be reconciled with a belief in secularism. I, I've personally known, uh, growing up in Texas myself, a large number of Christians, uh, Republicans and independents who didn't like the direction that the party was going in. Uh, if you remember, one of the original supporters of uh, the separation of church and state were the Anvil Baptists. Uh, so this idea that secularism is a liberal tradition or is a tradition that can only be supported by humanists uh, just doesn't square with the history. And I, I'll continue to work to make sure uh, that when Republicans are willing to work with us on religious freedom or the separation of church and state, that we take advantage of those opportunities and try to get something passed. On the point about, you know, where, where people want to say that, that both parties are the same, you know, are, are there, you know, if, if, uh, I would concede, okay, so there, there's certainly, there are people who are corrupt on either side. I'll, I'll grant that. That doesn't, that doesn't make them equal. There are very different. There might have there might have been a lot more equality, say, in 2000, you know, or in the 1990s. When I when I read the, the political party platforms for the Democrats and the Republicans, I could hardly discern a difference between them back then. But now there there are market differences. And as I said, if you go at the federal level, you might not see it so much. But you do see a lot more differences when you go to the state level. And there is also a great deal of division. Between, in the Republican Party, there's a great deal of division, and there's a great deal of division in the Democratic Party. People under, need to understand that why is there division, and it's significant for the election we just had and for the elections that are coming up. But to say that they're both the same and we shouldn't vote, it, this, is, this is how we got in this mess in the first place, in my opinion. Oh, yeah, voter apathy is tremendous, and, and hopefully we're waking out up from that, um, we'll see what happens, you know, this election year, and then if that can hold out through the next couple. Um, but again, the, there's apathy because people felt excluded. And the thing is, you have to make your within your local political party um, and political committees, and um, yeah, just don't be forced out of the process. Uh, you know, if, if you're not welcome, you know, make yourself welcome. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> You know, this, that, that, that election in 2014, where I mentioned we were electing a new governor here, uh, and we had Wendy Davis running up against Greg Abbott. I mean, Greg Abbott is a disaster. You know, he, he, he got every crony of the religious right into his in, into, into power. I mean, if we just had a few more people turn out that didn't have this apathy, we could have had Wendy Davis. We'd have been a lot better situation. Yeah. 
all across the board as far as maintaining our rights and 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 and, uh, and not being the embarrassment of the nation that we have subsequently become. And then we have this at the federal level. Now we're a world stage embarrassment daily. Right. I'm seeing I'm seeing stories now where you know we we, all, we hear about the, the 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 progressives that are now running. Uh, for offices, first time people running en masse and winning new seats. I mean, this is this is outstanding. But conversely, what do we have? We have an, uh, we have eight. I think there was yesterday was reported that eight white nationalists, people who identify as white nationalists or Nazis, running for and getting public office. What the hell is happening to our country? Well, they're winning primaries. We'll see if they win the general election uh, for those those eight. Uh, white supremacists. Um, but I mean, just to think about how much the Republican Party has changed. Gerald Ford was pro-choice. He supported the Equal Rights Amendment. I mean, you know, it's night and day um, um, from the from the 70s. So, But that's not necessarily, I think, a sign that things won't change. I think it's actually definitive proof that things have the capacity to change. Uh, but what's required is active participation in the political process. Um, if I were if I were my current age at the age that I was born, I mean, if, 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 if we were having this conversation in 1962, I would have identified as a Republican because, as you said, it, things have changed. And the Democrats and the Republicans effectively switched positions on a lot of their policies uh, in the 1960s. So, yeah, things do change. And we have a, we have a lot of Democrats that are that are that, as I said there's a there's a rift or a rebellion going on within the Democratic Party and in the 2016 election we certainly saw that going on in the Republican Party too and that's still ongoing because we have Republicans who are saying that you know that that they're not leaving the party they say the party left them that they had values like you're talking about with Gerald Ford and that you know something went awry and now and I I have a friend one of my dearest friends in the world is a Republican Party delegate. And he makes this same complaint that he doesn't like where his party has gone. I think the most shocking thing was seeing George Will not only leave the Republican Party, but ask for people to vote for Democrats. At that point in time, I, um, I felt like things <laughs> had definitely changed. Uh, I guess the last thing that I'll say before I drone on too much about this is that, you know, voting is a great start and it's something that every citizen should do. Um, I, I hear Ron talk all the time about um, doing more though and about whether whether that's you know going to town hall meetings with your local representative or city council uh going to our lobby days that we hold every single year uh, or even potentially considering a run for public office yourself i think it's enormously important in the point of history that we're at right now if they have the ability to uh to get out there and uh, make their voices be heard especially if they're humanists um the idea that someone's going to swoop in and fix everything magically it's just it's not not going to happen. Um, it requires active participation from all segments of society. Uh, and so I like to think that the uh, Center for Free Thought Equality uh, and our Free Thought Equality Fund Pack uh, is doing some of that work. Um, and I hope that more people are able to recognize that now is the time to act. And I, I just w I want to point out in, in following up what you just said, I mean, I'm, I'm just this guy, you know, and I've given testimony at, at, at the, the, the state house and at the Board of Education and a number of other things. And people can. They be, I've, I've met a number of the of political leaders in my state and I've, I've been as active as, as I think I can be and I continue to be so. And so, yes, people can j jump in and meet these people and actually start getting things done and get your opinion out there. I, and I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to tack on too much to that, but I agree with you is essentially what I'm saying. <laughs> Sorry, forgot to mute my phone. <laughs> but it is about, it's, it's simply about building relationships, especially with elected officials. You know, there's, there's nothing stopping our local nonprofit groups from having elected officials come speak to them and open up a dialogue with them on issues that are important with them in off election years. You can host candidate debates as long as you invite everybody and, uh, who's running to, to, to be in front of your group or a coalition of groups, um, again, to build relationships. Um, it's volunteering on campaigns. Um, again, they get to see you. They get to see what an atheist and humanist looks like. 
you send them some dollars, they really then will start to reach out to you because they want to build a relationship with you then. And, and the more we do that, the more we will change the minds of elected officials and get them to work for the issues that we care about and to say good things about the atheist and humanist community. Following up then and, and getting ready to close up, uh, Matthew, on the Darwin Day initiative, sure. where is that and where is it going? Uh, unfortunately, um, it's, it's looking like this year's resolution is, is not going to pass Congress in the current composition. Uh, what a surprise. <laughs> I can't tell you how shocked I am. <laughs> but, you know, I, I think the way things tend to work in Congress is that you build the levels of support every single year until the stars align and things go well and then you have an opportunity to push through. Um, we have about two dozen co-sponsors in the House of Representatives. Uh, we've got several sponsors in the Senate as well. Uh, and this is something that we're going to keep on pushing until it gets done. Uh, if there's any way, if there's any way at all that, that I can be involved in that or that anyone watching this can be involved in, in helping that succeed or, 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 or uh, advocating for this or, or trying to convince people or giving testimony or whatever it is, you know, please let us know. Absolutely. And, you know, we send out action alerts every single year where people directly uh, contact directly uh, with their representative. Um, those are enormously important. It's a good way of getting people uh, to co-sponsor legislation, um, but both with the Darwin Day bill and with uh, other pieces of legislation, just going to a simple town hall with your local representative uh, can be enormously important. Even if it's just to say for two seconds, I'm a humanist, I support your values, uh, I wanted you to recognize that I'm here uh, and to try to represent my community. Those sorts of things are important. At the end of the day, uh, these politicians want your support. They're there to convince you to vote for them. Uh, and that's a power that you have. And so I would just encourage people uh, to not abstain from using their power, uh, either by refusing to vote or by not participating in their political scene, uh, and by using that power to do some good. To, in my opinion, I think some good will be passing the Darwin Day resolution. So if you happen to see your representative uh, or now your senator, now that we have a Senate resolution introduced, take two seconds, talk to them about the bill. Um, we have tons of advocacy materials online, and I'd, of course, be more than happy to follow up with you or any other member uh, and discuss uh, some talking points, a quick elevator speech, things of that nature that can be effective tools for advocacy. Uh, and, you know, we didn't think the Congressional Free Thought Caucus was going to happen anytime soon, but that happened. And so I've got a lot of hope, maybe not faith, but hope uh, that we'll get these things accomplished in the near future. I got to tell you that a, a few years ago, uh, there was a group in Amarillo uh, where there was a, a number of people running for public office. We're all collected in this one room. Uh, and the, the audience, one of the members of the audience uh, asked these people, how do you represent your atheist constituents? And these uh, candidates all looked at each other, glanced confusion, and finally one of them said, our constituents are Christian. Yeah. Uh, so it's just, we, we were just eliminated literally without consideration and that's the thing that i want to see changed and they may keep on trying to say things like that but it won't be possible if people are open and vocal and are attending these events um it's up to us to change their minds it may be an unfair presumption on their part uh but most people won't really get rid of their biases on their own it's up to the impacted community to stand up and to to challenge them and i think that's uh, something that We'll keep on encouraging, and it seems like you're very much behind as well. Oh, I'm absolutely. You, 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 have, you guys have my complete support, and if there's anything I can do to assist or if there's anything we can do as an audience to assist, please let us know or let, let me know, and I'll let them know as best I can. Gentlemen, um, is there anything closing that you'd like to say? I'm going to let you guys have the last word here. I can't emphasize enough to become a member of the Center for Free Thought Equality. It's free. Go to our website, sign up. It's the only way to really know what's happening with the candidates that we're endorsing. Um, and again, change happens when we have a large enough body of people who are active. And we've got to uh, create institutions and do it at your local level, state level, federal level, and we can make real change in this country. Outstanding. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Right, thank, thank you. you.